All right. Hi, everybody. My name's Paula Sands. I'm one of the psychology interns at the Counseling Center at the University of Memphis. And we are, of course, switching to virtual everything. And so that includes our outreach work here at the university. And so uh, today I'm going to do my outreach, which if you can see the title, hopefully this is all working together. Um, I'm looking at women in psychology and social work, and we're going to talk about uh, the, sorry, uh, so we're going to talk about the important women of the two different fields, and um, some of these women you may have heard of if you're in the field, some of these women you may have not. I know I come from a psychology graduate program, and we often don't learn about a lot of the women um, that I'm talking about uh, here today, and we, I had never heard of them and didn't learn about them in my program, despite, you know, the importance that they've uh, added to the field. My colleague James, who helped me with research um, about the social work women and the aspects of social work, since that's the field he comes from, um, you know, was, was talking to me about how that's different in social work and how many of the pioneers and the founders of that field are women. And so to me, you know, it's always interesting to kind of see the differences in um, all of the different fields within the field of mental health work. But we're still gonna go through uh, that and some more today. So yeah, so like I said, kind of what we're gonna talk about today is reviewing important women in the field of psychology and social work. Uh, I'd love to hear from you all if you've heard about some of these people, if you haven't, um, you know, who you found most interesting, who you'd wanna learn more about. In theory, this would be something that, you know, we could talk about as a group um, at the outreach, but since we are virtual, um, feel free to toss it into the comments and we can kind of talk about it there. Um, or you all can talk about it there um, and kind of see maybe, you know, maybe you guys have heard about or learned about more of these people um, that I have not. I think would be an awesome to see sort of the environment of our field changing and, and who we're learning about. We're also going to talk about now and sort of the current state of affairs and the gender breakdowns um, in the workforce and the field here um, in psychology and social work, as well as kind of ending with a few, a few things that we can kind of hope for and look for in advocacy for more equality. Of course, that list is very long and um, I do not have the time or I'm sure you guys want to sit through all of the, you know, the finer details of all of that. So I tried to touch on um, some things that we can kind of hope that our organizations, APA for me, um, might do for us or could work for for us um, and maybe some things that we can kind of try and incorporate ourselves and kind of push for within our organizations or within our field. So let's start with some psychologists. All right, so we're starting at the, you know, turn of the century, sort of the late 1800s uh, in terms of, you know, when these people were around and when they were doing work, um, much like some of the intro psych people that we might also have heard about in programs, we're gonna kind of start back then. So. Um, we'll start off with Mary, who was actually the first woman um, to get her doctorate in psychology. Well, she's considered the first woman because she never actually got conferred a degree. So she, her father was a professor at a university up near Harvard and really worked hard to be able um, to get her kind of into classes, to be able to sort of, sort of like audit classes like we would do today um, and sit in on, on these Harvard psychology um, classes. She did all of the work sat in on all the classes. However, Harvard did not confer her degree because they did not accept women at that time and they didn't want to make an exception for her. So they did offer her um, a degree to be conferred via the Women's College, Radcliffe. However, she refused, stating you know, that that was unfair treatment and that she knew that her degree wouldn't carry the same weight coming from Radcliffe um, compared to Harvard. And uh, actually, to, still today, um, Harvard refuses to confer her degree. But Despite all of this, she is considered the first woman with her doctorate in psychology, and despite you know not actually getting the degree conferred to her, she was the first uh, female president of APA. She also established one of the first psychology labs at well Wesley. Well, Wellesley? Well, now I'm very confused about how I've said it, and we're going to hope for the best. All right, <laughs> so on to Margaret. So she was the first woman who was conferred her um, doctorate in psychology. She studied animal behavior, sense and perception, and consciousness that really laid the groundwork for ongoing studies of cognition in humans. She was a professor at Vassar for 36 years and really prioritized supporting the women there at that university and had labs that were you know, only manned by women. Funny, I'm funny. 
um, that, you know, only had women working in it. Uh, and she often um, had them as co-authors in all of her papers and tried to get them published and was really supporting um, the, what was at the time, a limited number in the field, um, a limited number of women in the field. She was also the second woman president of APA. So Ethel, much uh, like Calkins, she went to Harvard, had it audited, um, like, that's not what they called it, but that is what it is. <laughs> um, and again, Harvard refused to confer her her degree. Um, unlike Calkins, she did accept the degree from Radcliffe. Um, and she worked in academia after that um, until she was married. She only stopped because she uh, would no longer get hired by institutions. She actually got told that she should just not you know, bother applying anymore because no one's going to hire her. And so she transitioned that psychology work that she did to social activism and became um, a leader in the suffrages, suffrages, suffrage movement. This is probably going to continue. Really great with words. Um, and with her time, she also continued to research and write about this impossible position that she and many women um, are put into, of especially, you know, of managing getting married and also being able to stay in the workforce because people weren't um, institutions any place really weren't hiring married women. And so she continued to talk about and do research around that. Melanie, now this is one uh, person who compared to the others I did hear about, I knew about before, and potentially, you know, other people have, you all have, um, I'd be interested to know. Um, so she's one of the primary founders of object relations theory. Um, so I'm not here to teach you theory. We're not gonna go into all of that. I'm going to very broadly, very, very broadly kind of go over it. So it's um, a, a theory that falls under the umbrella umbrella of the psychodynamic, and it really focuses on the patterns of interpersonal relationships in people, especially the ones that develop throughout childhood. Um, it's an orientation that remains influential today, many people use, and is taught in schools and sort of in that psychodynamic realm. Uh, she, along with Anna Freud, um, despite their disagreements, both really set the stage for child psychology, starting with that psychoanalytic frame for child psychology. They did dis disagree on what the unconscious aims of children were. However, they you know, were both important people in the establishment of, of child psychology and really using psychology to work with children. Karen, uh, so she was one of the founding members of the Berlin Psychoanalytic Institute, um, which was psychoanalytic, as the name says, she did start to deviate from that very um, set Freudian psychoanalysis, um, which was unusual at the time, um, though it became more and more common. Uh, but she did deviate from that. She had theories on the possibility for human growth, self-actualization, which are words that we hear in humanistic psychology theories down the line, and she really influenced those people um, like Maslow and Rogers, which might be names that, if you're in the field, you might be more familiar with um, than hers. She was also a pioneer in feminine psychology and really worked on challenging some of those uh, Freudian ideas about women's desires for penises to, you know, sort of inhabit men's bodies, instead really focused on women's desire to be afforded that same status as men, not to be them, but, you know, to want to carry the same status in society as they did. Uh, she opened a clinic in New York in 1955 that is still opening and functioning today. Veta. Um, so she had a dissertation that really challenged this idea that women are psychologically impaired <laughs> when we're on our periods. Um, she obviously, as we may know, um, there's no empirical evidence supporting this. Uh, you know, as we, as we know, this thought can continue on. Um, and you know, back when the, you know, at the turn of the century, she's doing research that's showing that it's not, um, after grad school, she continued doing research, but kind of changed to focusing on uh, children's intelligence, ways to study their intelligence, and actually coined the word gifted, which we still use today. Maybe not as regularly, but definitely still talk about it. Anna Freud. Um, so this last name might sound pretty familiar to everybody um, who is in the field. Maybe if you're out of the field, you know, Freud, Sigmund Freud, it's a name that's thrown around quite a bit. So yes, she was uh, the daughter of Sigmund Freud. Uh, she never actually pursued a doctorate in psychology. Instead, she was actually trained as a teacher. Um, she did say that she absorbed so much from her father and his guests that she, you know, was sort of part of the field. She did uh, help develop, you know, child psychology, child psychoanalysis with Melanie, and 
despite you know the lack of the the formal degree. She also helped uh, develop the field of ego psychology, which is another umbrella under the umbrella of psychoanalysis. She also founded a clinic um, instead in London that is still open and functioning today. Inez, um, so she is tied for the first black woman to receive her doctorate in psychology. Unfortunately, she did die in a car crash less than a year after earning her degree and you, in that way didn't get to um, participate and create work in our field. However, her dissertation, though unpublished by her, was appropriated and published by other people, but it was very big and important um, research for Brown versus Board of Education. Nancy Bailey. So this is another name that, or last name that you might be familiar with. Um, if you're in the field, I know it was another name that I had heard a little bit, um, but didn't hear as much about her, but sort of knew of what um, she developed. So she developed the scales of infant development, uh, which are you know, a measure that we use to kind of measure that development of infants and toddlers using play to develop, you know, to, to kind of check in about their physical, mental, and motor development. So this stemmed from her research at what I'm, at her, bleh, her research on a longitudinal growth study that looked at developing uh, like milestones and sort of understanding more about kids' uh, physical development and even th like through on the whole course of development, but really kind of helped us get those like baselines, those developmental kind of milestones that we may still talk about today. Um, she continued that research by adding in the mental, mental and the motor piece and then developing um, these scales specifically for infant development. Ruth, she's the other woman who's tied for the first black woman to receive her doctorate in psychology. For her dissertation, she studied triplets um, and tried to get a better understanding of that nature to nurture uh, debate that we often still talk about. Uh, so in her career after um, training, she focused on the therapy and um, evaluation of children and adolescents and actually worked as, as a supervisor at the National Youth Administration in Chicago. So Mammy, um, she defined race, race conscientiousness, I always mess up that word, <laughs> um, not race conscientiousness. I can say smaller words. Um, but it's the um, conscientious is of self as belonging to the specific group, which is different, differentiated by other groups by obvious physical characteristics. So an important, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Construct, an important construct in the field. So she's best known for the doll study, which was used in research uh, for board versus Brown. Brown versus board of education. I cannot talk today. I'm so very sorry. Um, so this doll study was used to assess uh, racial identification and preferences in black children aged three to seven. And she looked at um, black children in racially segregated schools as well as racially mixed schools and found that the identification and the preferences and the development of these kids was more positive um, and had a more positive race conscientiousness um, in these mixed schools and really supported um, you know, the, the integration of schools. So let's talk about some social workers. All right, so Jane Addams, she's um, considered an inspiration around the globe. So she chose to voluntarily live with the poorest of Americans to really try and help understand their plight more. Um, she was moved by what she discovered and she founded Hull House, which is um, in Chicago, still, in, <laughs> still there. Um, it's a huge social services agency that's um, that has assisted up to like 2,000 people per week, which is just an insane number um, when I try and think about it. Um, so she's famously been opposed to World War I and is a pacifist and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. Um, so kind of in this, so she, you know, chose to voluntarily live with um, the poorest Americans and sort of what I've talked with my colleague about for social work. And so it's... Um, the like formalization of the like volunteering to help people and um, really the founders kind of finding a way to form to like formalize this um, like formally study the social conditions and the human behavior and how that is affected by the environment and really creating um, like a system um, that we now call social work. Hope that makes sense. Um, so Mary Richmond, 
Um, she was another pioneer in the field. She published uh, Social Diagnosis, which combined um, medicine, law, psychology, history, and psychiatry into a guide that was used to train later social workers. And she really worked to standardize the concepts and the practice of social work and to, like I was saying, like formalize this field. Um, and she worked to create a network of social um, workers and really methodize the way that they all did their work um, so that everyone was sort of doing the same things to help and really doing that research of what you know was helpful. Uh, Mary, so she kind of sounds like combined uh, psychology, some psychiatry into social work and developed um, a psychiatric training curric curriculum. Um, she kind of focused on the internal personal distress instead of just the environment, environmental, which was sort of the norm and really kind of worked to integrate those two and um, worked with the mental hygiene movement during World War II um, to really expand the scope of social work um, and incorporate that psychological element to it and really kind of integrate everything together. Jeanette, um, she paved the way for generations of uh, future social workers. Uh, she became the first woman elected to Congress, and she was the only member of Congress to vote against World Wars I and II. Um, she was a pa uh, well-known pacifist and also worked um, in the suffrage movement, and she was selected to serve um, on the Women's International Conference for Peace and really dedicated her work to pacifism. Wow, that sounds wrong when I say it. Pacifism? I'm going to stick with it. Um, throughout the uh, Korean and Vietnam Wars, um, even as she uh, got older and might not have been working outside. All right, so very quick run through of uh, women in the field. There are many other women, a Google search will show you tons of them. There are women currently in the field who are you know, continuing to do groundbreaking work um, in our fields that may or may not be taught. And so this was just a quick kind of overview of some women at the turn of the century, some that I had never heard of, some that I had, to kind of get this conversation and the understanding started that, you know, the, psych the field of psychology often, we look at it as founded by, um, you know, a lot of men and rarely do we think about or know about the women in the field. And though it very much, you know, was founded by men, there are important women in that field and it's important to make sure that we pay attention and know about them and also that we, as women in the field, or women who are thinking about going into the field, or know someone who is, or just is interested in all of this, um, that we know about them, and that we know about the people who are happening now, and, you know, there's a lot out there. This could go for way longer, um, but I know that nobody wants to watch a video that long. So, <laughs> we're going to jump into uh, some of the current demographics um, of the mental health field, and psych um, psychology, and social work, and kind of what we're looking at now. So, We'll start with grad programs and just giving you some, some numbers, some statistics that we have. So in 2014, 75% of uh, clinical doc programs, 75% um, of the students were women, um, which is a 27% increase over um, 10 years, uh, which is quite a bit. Um, so women, including racial and ethnic minority women, are enrolled in psychology programs at a higher rate than men now, um, starting around 1995. Um, more, deg more psychology degrees, uh, psychology doctorates specifically were conferred to white and racial ethnic, ethnic minority women um, than there were men, and that trend has continued since 1995. Um, so in 2015, we had 86% of MSW graduates being women, and interestingly, um, part of going to grad school is very often the case that you're taking out student loans, and research has found that women graduate um, from psychology doctorate programs with more student debt than men and racial and ethnic minority um, and older women graduate with more debt than white women. So talking about some employment settings, some representation there. Um, so re research shows uh, that there are more men than women in the research and management positions and more women in the direct service positions, which is pretty common to what we see sort of outside the field of psychology and in a lot of other fields. Often men are still in those research and those management positions and women are more often the ones kind of in the lower level doing that direct service um, work or like teaching in those kinds of fields. So in 2003, 
um, 70% of women in the psychology workforce were um, employed full-time. Um, the, num the percentage is higher for men. Um, again, this is pretty consistent with research from other fields. And, you know, across fields, women are often the ones that do more of the child care and the home care and will sort of be underemployed or work part-time when maybe they would prefer to work full-time or um, other things because often those responsibilities are placed upon us. Um, so in 2019, 81.9% of professional social worker positions were staffed by females, which is a large majority. Um, so let's talk about the pay gap. So we'll start with psychologists. So in 2010, psychologists um, are paid less than doctorate level positions in a lot of other science fields. And the pay gap in psychology is larger between men and women than it is in those other fields. So there's a pay gap in all of the fields. Um, as we all may know, <laughs> there's a pay gap. There's a pay gap pretty much everywhere. Um, however, the pay gap in psychology is bigger um, than the pay gap in other um, like science or research fields. So in health service positions, that's a fancy term for the therapists. Uh, so people doing therapy versus like people doing research or management positions, men earned on average about $40,000 more a year than women, which is an insane amount of money. Um, so uh, APA compared data from 2001 to 2010 and actually found that the wage gap increased throughout those nine years. Um, researchers aren't totally sure kind of what's going on, but suggested that this may be due to an increase um, of young women in the workforce. Um, and since we're getting paid less than our male counterparts, that could kind of be part of the increase in the wage gap as opposed to the decrease in the wage gap. But again, that shows a, a very significant problem in the field um, that needs to be addressed. Um, more uh, information for psychologists. So looking at just academic jobs, you know, professors, white women earn less than their racial and ethnic than racial and ethnic men and less than white men, but that gap between white women and racial ethnic men is smaller than compared to white men and white women. This is something that we might all have heard in other fields. And racial ethnic minority women earn less than their white female peers. And racial and ethnic minority women earn less than their um, racial and ethnic minority men, male peers. I hope that all makes sense. Um, this is, again, something that we all kind of know about is pretty consistent across fields, um, but psychology is not immune to that. So um, talking about it for social workers. So in 2006, the difference in salary averages between men and women was about $12,000, a little over. If you controlled it for a lot of other factors, that decreased to about a difference of 7000 but that's still a 14% gap in pay. Um, and any gap is too much. Um, and... 89% um, of the lowest earners in social work were women, which is pretty much the majority. And on average, uh, men out earn women in all service areas for social work. So, of course, there is, um, and at the end of this, I'll have um, kind of some like links if you wanted to read more about this, if it's something um, that you kind of want to do more research on. But there's tons of data out there about all of the different um, racial breakdowns in all of the various fields of psychology as well as social work. This was a very short overview of some of the things that to me stuck out the most. Um, like I said, I'm one of the psych interns. I'm going on into, you know, graduating and getting, you know, joining the workforce outside of school. And so to me, you know, these were kinds of the things that stuck out and I wanted to pass that on. Um, but there's lots of information out there about that. Um, APA has a whole, uh, task force that, um, did that research that compared 2001 or 2004 to 2014. It's a huge PDF full of information um, that's very interesting, also concerning, but very interesting. Um, and at the end of that, they wrapped up with lots of lists of things that we could do for advocacy. So this is, again, a very short amount of what's totally out there, but some that stuck out to me that I wanted to make sure I pass on. So the Committee on Women in Psychology, which is part of APA, um, had some recommendations, and so um, here's the ones that stuck out to me. So really, APA needing to advocate for equal pay and supporting policies that focus on the equality, um, on equality in the workforce. APA is a very large organization, and so having them um, doing that advocacy and really supporting those policies would be huge. Um, 
they talked about encouraging wage transparency, um, which is this idea of, of talking about what we make with our peers. Um, I know talking about money is a really taboo subject often case, but if we don't talk about what our salaries are with the people who work with us and who are our peers, and in theory, you know, we assume that we're all making the same, we very much well might not be. Um, so encouraging that transparency and supporting talking about your salary and your pay with your colleagues and peers um, opens that up so that the office that you work in is held accountable because we all know what we make um, and we know who's being paid less and, you know, for the same positions. Supporting policy, um, this one I thought was interesting, supporting policy to let DOC students sit for licensure directly after graduation. Um, without our license, we um, can get paid less and often we are paid less than we would once we're licensed because we'll be under someone else's license. So supporting our ability um, as doctoral students to be licensed right after graduation takes out a whole year of a decreased pay um, for full-time work, which I think would be awesome <laughs> to have, to you know be able to jump into a more competitive salary right off the bat. Um, increased payment for direct services. This is important because if you remember before, I talked about how women are still more often the people who provide those direct services and direct services aren't paid as high as the management and the research positions. And so increasing that pay for direct services would automatically benefit women because that's where the majority of women work is in direct services. Um, and really kind of a push for our grad programs across the board to uh, kind of increase the financial planning, the understanding of the loans that we're taking on and how to pay it off and how much we should get paid in the field and really um, making that a part of our professional development and what is sort of the expected, you know, salaries or compensations that we should be making sort of where we're at in that regard to the field. I know I didn't talk about that much in my doc program. I have no idea. Um, Google that to figure it out. And that's not, you know, it's kind of going back to that wage transparency piece and being able to talk about what we often, you know, what we should be compensated, how we think about how we're compensated, how we negotiate for that and how that all goes into how we pay off our loans um, that we all take on to do these jobs, regardless of what, you know, what area of mental health you decide to go work in. Um, it's very hard to graduate anything here in the U.S. without loans, any undergrad, any grad, anything at all, um, as we all are quite likely very aware. So kind of increasing that, that professional development piece of how to kind of plan, how to maybe try and get uh, financial support throughout grad school so that we don't have to take on as many loans. Any kind of talk about that would be something that they um, included on recommendations. So, like I said, some resources for, for more research for yourself. So these are the different um, areas of psychology, the Committee on Women in Psychology and Social Work that you can um, look up to get more of this information on your own. You can always Google Women in the Field to get more um, information. So, yeah, I hope that this was informative um, and interesting, and I'd love to hear thoughts or women that you found interesting or information on, you know, what's going on in the field or ideas for advocacy down below. Um, yeah, so hope you all have a good day, and see you later.